Hey everybody, I want to speak a little bit why you all, we all need more space. And to understand a little bit what I'm talking about, um, I want to go back to history. This was my hero when I was six. Who had that also as hero? Superman? Yes, very good. It was cool. Um, Clark Kent, falling in love loosely, working with the Daily Planet, and this was the Man of Steel. But he was not only the Man of Steel, enormous power, he was also flying, and that was amazing. And what I really liked as a kid at the age of six was his view, the Superman view. Because it was the X-ray view, he was looking through things, but also the infrared view, the scan view, the microscopic view. He was seeing far away. So when we look to Superman, he was already in the visible area, seeing and look behind the things. So one plus N. But um, the kids at that age, they're changing the heroes pretty quick. And when I was three years old, no, later, so I was nine, that was my hero, you know? Who remember that Lego space? Yes, very good. I have to do some branding here. So there were yellow, green, uh, green blue, white, and transparent uh, yellow, I think. But the blue one was the boss. There was only one, the rest were more. And um, they had already buggies, robots, spaceships, uh, lunar base. And then three years later, I think it was 91, when the first shuttle, Columbus shuttle was starting, the Lego had already the, um, the space shuttle as a small thing. And I never stopped to have this as my hero. Maybe not this person, but our astronauts like Gregory uh, were before. But things are changing. And when we're looking now to space, and this is the view from the International Space Station out of the cupola, space learns us three things. Number one, you have the best view, as you heard. It's amazing. Wasn't it amazing what we saw? And space is fast. 28,000 kilometers per hour. That's the speed of the space station. 90 minutes rotating Earth. And in other things, there are also space supergirls there. So it's not only guys, it's also ladies. That is Samantha Cristoforetti. She was from November 2014 to June 2015, 119 days on the space station. And you see, special space suit, Star Trek. So we like what we do. And when we go back to Superman, and what I want to tell you is, what happened if we take the Superman view, one plus N, and multiply it with space. And I want to talk about the future of maps and what that has to do with lasagna. This is the oldest map we know in mankind. Imago Mundi, 2,600 years old. You see Babylon in the middle with the river of Euphrates surrounded by the mantlas of Assyria. And um, there were stars going, and one star goes to the north to the map that was at that time the area where the people live in the darkness, where the people do not see anything. So that was Europe at that time. And the map has not changed the last 2,550 years. It was still two-dimensional, no Superman view. We changed maybe by navigating to the stars, by navigating with our satellites, but still two-dimensional. But this is not true. Nowadays, the map is not 2D. I'm grown up with maps, you know, fault maps, one extracted, you never got them back again. Yeah, that was the sales trick. But when you, for example, in summer go swimming, I can tell you what is the water temperature, what is the water visibility, what is the water's uh, current, I can tell you what is the wind speed, what was the wind speed, I can tell you which sun cream you have to take, I can tell you what ozone level, because maybe your kids or your brother has asthma, I can even tell you on the grass where you're sitting on if this grass needs more fertilizer. Thank to space data. ESA is collecting eight terabytes of data a day. That's a lot. And a satellite image has up to 500 layers. And we shoot more and more satellites up telling us live what's going on on our planet. So the map of the future is not two-dimensional, it's not four-dimensional, it's, it's three-dimensional, it's like a lasagna, layer of layer of layer. Depending where you are, you have different tastes. So, looking now of the Superman view of the future, what we do with the three, four dimensional layer, I give you some example to make it a little bit more tasty for you. Rips. 
Now we here we are. So a Superman view on this city. So this is Helsinki. You see Helsinki on the right. Maybe you see the airport on, on the other part. This was done in 2009. This is in the visible image. And you see the shallow waters yeah, of the coast of the 300 islands. And the, the, the green on the left, this is the national park. But we also have invisible stuff. Radar. You see the ice. You see the shipping routes. And you can even see movements. So these are images made by three time slots. The green in the north is ice. Also on the Baltic Sea to the Estonia, you see also ice. The Superman view and the Superman eyes are our satellites. And these are only three, four layers of satellite data, what we can do. So the future will be not only getting the data, it will be the data fracking. What you get out of these four-dimensional matrix, because you can go to the history, you can go to the future. And if you add these layers with seismic data, with statistic data, you got really the power to navigate into a system. This one is pretty cool. And we see more and more startups coming that in our incubation centers. We support 150 new startups in our incubation centers every year within Europe and more and more investing in this area. Trust me, Facebook is Mickey Mouse against this stuff. I'll tell you why. Good example is the open data portal of New York. They have 1,500 different layer points. So a matrix of 1,500. Imagine what you can do. So this is the city. And then you see what is the Green Vegas station. You go, where's the transportation? You can even go back to history. 9-11, you see the smoke? You can also see what is the average population age in New York, and you can even see where are the accidents in the last two, three days. You can even see where is the spot where the police writes most of the tickets. So we go one plus N high S. Previously, that was, I think, last week we published it. We, we made a, a radar screen over, or radar images over San Francisco. And maybe you saw that as a tweet or a spot. We found out something pretty cool. We found out that there is one tower called the Millennium Tower in San Francisco. You heard about that story? Yeah? Has anybody uh, uh, fled there? Hopefully not, because they were building the tower 2009. 58 floors high, 200 meters, and on the top you have a nice view. You see Treasure Islands, you see the Oakland Bay Bridge, and these apartments cost millions. The problem is, we have proven that this building was sinking since 2008 by 40 centimeters. If you have a 200 meter scraper, you don't want that it's sinking. So somebody was making cheap basements. And maybe you see there is a spot there. Green spots are good. This is okay. If you have blue spots, it's worse because then the movement is over 4 millimeter, 40 millimeters or 4 centimeters a year. On this tower and the towers next, we see red spots. That means this is going down into the ground by 4 centimeter a year. And when you want to see that for San Francisco, and this is owned by radar data, it's one of N applications what we can do. It's all pretty good, but there are also still yellow spots. You don't want to have that. So we have already one startup company which is going in radar images. And this company is called Building Radar. It's one of my favorites at the moment. And Building Radar takes where are open new construction sites for big buildings. But when you want to sell something to these construction sites, you have to know in which stage of the construction they are. So what do you do? You send your sales force. Oh, no, it's too early. Come back in maybe two months. Oh, no, it's too late. You got, didn't get a contract. So what they say, instead of sending people around to the construction site, we take radar data, and then we know how far they are. 30 people, three investors. And when you think that even further this business, and we spoke that to Allianz and to the CEO, I said, with radar data, I can tell you easily every building in Germany which is built without building permit. And either you're the good cop or the bad cop. The good cop is, oh, my friend, you have insurance with us, you're underinsured, you know, we signed a new contract. The bad cop would be, you have a claim, we can't pay because it's not valid anymore. 
is one of an application of what you can do. You can also see which bridge is moving, road maintenance. And this is all big data. But also for society, and this is a study which uh, Neil Jean from Stanford University has done. When you're looking to Africa, if you want to steer a country, you need the development, the economical development, you need data. And between 2000 and 2010, out of the 59 countries of Africa, only 39 have conducted in 10 years two study of the economic development. That is bad. How you want to steer something when you don't have the information? So, they used satellite data. Where we have more roads, where we have more bridge, where we have more light, where we have more metal roofs. And with this, they were capable to see where is the economical development in these countries. Amazing. Just a computer program superimposing the data. And you get a new result. And by the way, in Japan, the rice price is also calculated with satellite data. So what is the trend? We bring all the data, Copernicus data, other data, into the cloud. And we want that the programmers, the developers of iOS or Android is using that. We want that the future is not one-to-one, -one, that the future is end-to-end. -end. And when we look into Google, Google has invested 30 million, billion in the last years in that. Skybox, here, um, um, and Waze. So the, the, the fight will be about the maps of the future and what we can do out of it. And as I said, moving from one-to-one -to, -one to end to end you program the logic, you make micro payments to it, and you sell it many, many times. The future will be not an app store, the future will be a logic store, using that matrix and that power. To doing that, we have to change a little bit how we think. We still educate people for uh, uh, industry of the last century. And this we have to change. We have to think in matrix. We have to think in systems. And I give you a good example where we have started to do that. Car navigation. We navigate since 20 years. That is pretty cool. We maybe have started with deep learning. But what I think was a mistake from Nokia was selling the here platform to the German car manufacturers last year. Price point 2.5 billion. BMW, Mercedes, Volkswagen bought it. And when you have a car, who has a car of a German manufacturer not older than five years, six years? Yeah, very good. Thank you very much for the car industry because you're transmitting data. So and this is what they announced four weeks ago. When you put the mist glide on, when you break the brakes, when you put the wipers on, even the cameras, see what, where you are and if there are temporary stop signs. They put it into the cloud and you will get the data. They know within five minutes if there is a new roundabout. This is the base of mobile and future and autonomous driving. And when we look further, and I don't know who's using drive now, I don't want to walk to the car. I want that the car comes to me. Yeah, because it's an autonomous car. Because it will take a little bit longer than we have this scene that our robots drive the car. And even if this is the case, they will need satellite communication in the remote places via satellite by the mega constellations. And it has also impact to industry like shipping. This is the automatic identification system which ships have on board. And we tracked it from satellite. We know exactly how much cars are on ships across the world. How many gas and how many crude oil is on the ships on the world. How much cargo is going on. And this is showing the traffic in the world. This data and this know-how you need for one thing, which will be the autonomous shipping. 90% of the world trade is going via ships. 375,000 billion in the freight industry. And cargo costs are not the highest, it's the manpower cost. 44% goes into the manpower. And we will start to build the cargo, the ship around the cargo, not around the humans. Going back to Superman, when he wants to have a trip, he does not have the bad mobile, he will have that. It's one of our startup companies printing this plane at the moment in Oberpfaffenhofen. And they need autonomous flying, they need secure signals, and this is one of our companies we have supported last year. So how the future will change, this is my hero. 
my son Johannes. He was five years old. And why I'm showing that? Because he was going the first time the red slope. You see, he's still smiling. He was falling down 10 times, standing up, falling down 10 times. Never give up. No fear and little respect. We have to stay curious like our kids and not be frightened what the future will bring, make the best out of it. And from my other son, Lucas, this is his hero. Pokemon Go. And this is also more, the, you have a virtual layer, you have a real layer and your virtual environment and you have navigation via Genus SS. So when I see my kids, they remind me to live in the present and see the future and the present with their eyes. And uh, imagination and curiosity are driving exploration and they're driving also space. This is the reason why I'm working for, for my great organization, the European Space Agency. And exploration leads to innovation. As everyone can be supermen or superwomen, the only thing what you have to do, you have to add space a little bit more to your daily work. Thank you very much.